I don't have to preach, do I? I really don't. You guys just saw church happen. Because that's, that's why we're here. Because what this God does for us is amazing. God touches us in so many ways and changes our life. And sometimes God changes our life when we don't even realize it's happening. I thank God for that every day. So uh, last week, Reverend Michael made a little joke about uh, how we're preaching the sermon series from uh, Philippians. He thought it was Philemon. And uh, <laughs> P-H-I-L, whatever. And I agree. Like, I really wanted that Philemon passage. Like, I was all about it. It was fine. But no, we're here in Philippians. And as I was preparing for this uh, sermon uh, this past week over Martin Luther King weekend, um, I was actually really glad that we had this Philippians passage. And you'll hear in a second. But uh, it's one of those passages that um, is really fitting for Martin Luther King because, um, uh, and, and even as we just heard the story, right, uh, this passage talks about pressing on and what does it mean when we in our very lives need to press on the pursuit of what God has called us to do. So I invite you to uh, stay in your seats, but hear these words. It comes from the third chapter of the book, uh, the letter, Paul's letter to the Philippians. I want to know Christ, he says. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Siblings, I do not consider myself to have reached the goal. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the mark to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. So throughout the last few weeks, we've been reflecting on this letter to the Philippians as we unpack what it means for us to come individually into this new year, bringing a new attitude, an attitude of transformation, of changing, of finding, embracing, and equipping our old selves that we might be open to God's new possibilities in our midst. Throughout this new year, we've been reflecting on what it means to bring a brand new you to a brand new year that we might have a hand in creating a brand new world together. We began this sermon series with a reflection on getting real about where we are in our lives. We heard of Paul's honesty about where he is in his life, in prison, and how when Paul was able to get real with that reality, that he was able to see where he would, where some good and even some God could come out of some less than ideal situations. And last week, we reflected on Paul getting perspective. We were reminded that if Paul, sitting in the bowels of jail, could keep it real about where he was and see that there was some opportunity for good to come, then we could too. That when we get new perspectives about the things that go on in our lives, we're not just changing our minds or our outlook, but we are actually allowing God's presence to move through us into the world in a brand new way. And in both of our previous two weeks' readings, we heard the sound of Paul's optimism in this letter. We saw Paul's ability to see that good things can come from less than perfect situations and that getting real and getting perspective can open up the world of a possibility for our brand new selves. And indeed, as we read Paul's letter to the Philippians, we should note the threads of joy that weave their way through. For Paul is joyful. He's grounded. He's at peace with this situation, and he's focused on his mission. And yet, and yet as we come to our reading today, we should be getting a sense that Paul's optimism is not just grounded in the promise of positive outcomes. 
Paul's joy is not because he knows that everything is going to turn out just fine. Paul's optimism comes not just from knowing that they're stuck in jail. He might be able to spread the gospel a little bit further and a little bit wider, that he might be able to share the message with many more who will listen to him. For Paul, optimism comes not from the knowledge that good things come from bad situations, but rather that bad situations can come out of good convictions. Paul's optimism comes not from his belief that something good can come from his stint in jail. Paul's optimism comes from his sense of purpose and from his fervent belief in all of those things that landed him in jail in the first place. Hear his words. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of the resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him even in death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, he says, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. But I press on on. Paul says he wants to be like Christ. He wants to be one with Christ. He wants to share the message of Christ. He wants to live in the way of Christ. And for Paul, living in the way of Christ means living as Christ lived, suffering as Christ suffered, dying as Christ died, and knowing the power of Christ's resurrection in all he is and does. For Paul, optimism comes from his sense of purpose, from a sense of understanding that if he is truly living in the way of Christ, it is not a matter of if hard things are going to happen, but when they do happen, how he will choose to respond. In today's passage, Paul offers us a black and white way of living. He offers us a stark reminder of the obligations of one who calls himself a Christian that to follow in the way of Christ means always pressing on in the way of Christ, even when our pressing on may press right back in hard and painful ways. And so as we read Paul's letter to the Philippians and hear of his own determination to keep pressing on, we too might also hear Paul's call to us to press on with him. And in that call, we might hear the question, By what convictions do you live? And more importantly, for what convictions are you willing to die? In order to enter the main building of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, a visitor must walk down the avenue of the righteous among nations. Situated in the middle of a very large garden, this tree-lined walkway in the surrounding landscape commemorates those many non-Jews who risked their lives and their livelihood in order to save Jews from the hands of the Nazis during the Holocaust. As you walk down the avenue and stroll reflectively through the winding paths that weave through the surrounding garden, you may become overwhelmed with awe as you realize that each of the more than 2,000 trees that line the path were planted to commemorate a unique person, and that each tree represents the life of one who worked diligently and under great threat to save the lives of countless others. And as you walk through the garden, You might become overwhelmed with awe as you learn the stories of some of the thousands of names engraved on the stone walls that form the many coves and inlets. When you hear the names of the many stories of the ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And if you're like me, you may become overwhelmed with awe as you look around you and you cannot see through the trees and the benches and the signs and the engravings through the more than 25,000 markers commemorating those who worked with their lives ceaselessly to save Jews from certain extermination. I imagine that many who walk down the aisle, the avenue of the righteous among nations, or who take time to sit with the names that fill the garden walls, that they are as much overwhelmed by the stories of those remembered there as they are by their own answers to the question, in the same situation, 
would I have done the same? Would I have opened my door to the frantic knock in the middle of the night? Would I have opened the hidden passage in my house? Would I have secretly employed those fleeing for their lives, and would I have arranged for their escape? Would I have said yes when the call came, or would I have said no? A few years ago, as I sat in that garden, I wanted so badly to say that I too would have been counted among those who risked their lives to choose good instead of evil. I wanted so badly to know that when faced with an impossible decision between my life and the lives of many others, the pursuit of safety for the many would have been the only pursuit I could have followed. I so badly wanted to be assured that when faced with the decision between what is right and what is wrong, I would always choose the hard path of the righteous and integrity over the easy path of complacency and the status quo. I wanted to know with conviction that the, when the world goes to pieces and all goodness and all peace and all love goes astray, that I would unwaveringly follow in the way of Christ, who through his life and his ministry reminds us over and over again that it is better to sacrifice yourself in the name of justice than to sacrifice another in the pursuit of personal power or even personal safety. I wanted so badly to know that when confronted with impossible odds and unbearable circumstances that I, like Paul, would press on, undaunted, undeterred, undiscouraged, with Christ always at my side. But as I sat in the garden of the righteous among nations, among the trees and the plaques commemorating 25,000 brave souls who risked it all, life and limb, to save others, it was hard to grapple with the thought that I myself might not have been so brave. On the New England Holocaust Memorial in Boston, there's a quote from a man named Martin Niemöller, who was a Lutheran minister in Germany during the Holocaust. As a young man, he distinguished himself in the German Navy as an officer and a commander of a German U-boat boat during World War I. He was proud of his country and his service, but when Germany's defeat, with, the, with Germany's defeat in the First World War, he found himself at political odds with the Weimar government. Forced to give up his U-boat and his office, he, like many Germans, felt like the changing government had abandoned him and left him on his own. Disenfranchised, he sympathized and supported the rising Nazi regime. Niemöller went on to pursue seminary and found himself in a prominent church in Berlin, where he was widely supported and his anti-Semitic sermons drew a large crowd every week. Quickly, however, Niemöller's support for the Nazi government began to wane. But it wasn't because of the dangerous and xenophobic policies that were being solidified under the Nazi regime that ignited the spark in him of resistance. It was instead the Nazi interference in the life of the church and the removal of the rights of Christians of Jewish descent that caused him to take action. In short, it was only when his own rights began to be infringed upon that he spoke up. Regardless of his motivation, his actions against the Nazi government were impactful and led to his arrest, apparently under orders from Hitler himself. And Niemöller spent the rest of the war imprisoned in concentration camps. Unlike millions of others, Martin Niemöller survived the war imprisoned by the Nazis. His survival allowed him to live on late into life as an ardent anti-war activist, and he spoke with ferocity about the importance of not remaining silent in the face of injustice. His famous quote, which is found in a few different forms, which is printed in the Holocaust Memorial in Boston, reads as follows, and you know it. They came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, but I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. They came for the trade unionists, but I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. They came for the Catholics, but I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, no one was left to speak up. Over the last several months, I've seen this quote shared widely across social media. 
among other things. Last fall marked the 80th anniversary of one of the defining moments in the Second World War, an event that is widely understood as the beginning of the Holocaust as we know it. November 9, 1938, Germans, fueled by anti-Jewish sentiment and supported by Nazi-issued propaganda, went on a rampage of terror that specifically targeted Jewish businesses, synagogues, and Jews themselves. According to Nazi totals, 8,000 buildings across Germany were vandalized and defaced with anti-Jewish slogans and slurs. Nearly 100 Jews were murdered. Glass from windows strewn the streets, giving the name of the event Kristallnacht, Crystal Night, or the Night of Shattered Glass. Two days later, on November 11, 30,000 Jews were rounded up and deported to concentration camps at Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen. This act brought to the sur their surface the reign of terror that had already existed in Germany and would soon be at the forefront of the minds of people across the world. They say that hindsight is 2020, that when we know what we now know, we can look back and feel confident at what we would have and could have and should have done. That when we look back on that day 80, 80 years ago, we can proclaim badly that had we known, had we known that this was what the future held, we would have stood up, we would have spoken up, we would have put our bodies between the rocks and the windows and used ourselves as human shields. We would have opened our homes and our safe places to our human siblings and we would have gathered arm in arm, linked in front of rail cars and tanks and trucks to do everything in our power and anything at all to reorient the world towards justice. It is that 2020 vision in hindsight that tells us it would have been us doing just what Christ has called us to do that if we had been there during this pivotal moment 80 years ago, it would have been us giving up our hands and our feet and our eyes that our neighbors and friends might have a future in which they could feel and walk and see. It would have been us. We would have fought and screamed and joined together. It would have been us. We would not have stayed silent. But two days later, 30,000 Jews were rounded up and deported to concentration camps. And over the next six years, millions more would take that same journey, and million more, millions more would die. Martin Niemöller was a Lutheran minister who devoted his life to following in the way of Christ. And yet, even as a follower of Christ, an ordained minister, he felt sympathy to the ideologies of the Nazi government ideologies that tended towards pointing a finger rather than lending a hand, ideologies that would exclude people who thought and acted and believed differently than the prevailing power, ideologies that said, whoever is not with us is against us, rather than the idea of Jesus who declares, whoever is not against us is with us. It wasn't until the communities of which he was a part and Niemöller himself came under attack by these ideologies that he began to act against them. For his life following the war, Niemöller is said to have lived with the guilt of not taking a stand against the forces of evil until they came knocking on his door. When all of the networks and systems that were designed to protect him and those around him had been stripped away. They came for the communists, the Jews, the trade unionists, the Catholics, and I didn't speak up. But then they came for me and by that time, there was no one left to speak up. A Saturday morning, I read Niemöller's quote attached to an article about Kristallnacht and the rise of fascism and things like that 80 years ago. But by Tuesday evening of this week, I had read this poem more times than I could count, shared not in response to the historical past, but to the real and present uh, present future, designed and shared in response to events that were happening this very week. They were beaten senseless for holding hands and walking down the street. Sitting in a hospital, they weren't sure how they were going to pay for their medical bills. They came for my queer friends and neighbors, but I didn't speak up because I am not queer. A young man laughed in the face of his native elder, <laughs> 
Two hundred young men surrounded the elder and called him names. The adults were nowhere in sight. They came from my indigenous friends and neighbors, but I did not speak up because I am not Native American. The highest courts in the land told them that their service to their country was less important than our bigoted perceptions of gender. They said, you served your country for our right to hate you. They came for our transgender siblings and neighbors, but I did not speak up because I am not transgender. She was at Reunion Tower, taking in the Dallas skyline. A woman came up to her and ripped her hijab off her head. You can't wear that here. Go back to your country. They came for our Muslim neighbors and friends, but I did not speak up because I am not a Muslim. He came out to his car to find all four tires slashed, but I did not speak up for my black neighbors and friends. She was walking to math class at her high school. She was pumping gas. She was getting coffee. She was heading home. Are you gone yet? Build a wall. Grab her by the, I should kill you right now. You are a waste of air. They came for our sisters and our mothers and our daughters and our wives. But I did not speak up because I am not a woman. I did not speak up, not for my Muslim friends and neighbors, not for my black friends and neighbors, not for my LGBTQ friends and neighbors. I did not speak up for my immigrant neighbors or my disabled friends and neighbors. I did not speak up when it mattered the most. As Christians, we must remember they also came for Christ. It wasn't because he expressed a theological doctrine or dogma that ruffled the feathers of the powers that be, but because he spoke out for his siblings, for God's diverse creation, for the tax collectors and the widows, for the sex workers and the impoverished. They came for Christ because he dared to say, you matter to those that society had pushed aside. They came for Christ. But by then, Christ knew it was too late. Jesus gave himself to the cross so that no other should have to live as he did, that in his sacrifice, he could offer up a brand new view of the world, one in which God's beloved creation lives in peaceful harmony, befitting the kingdom of God. But Paul reminds us in his sacrifice that Jesus did not absolve us, his followers of our God-given purpose in life and in faith. He did not absolve us of our call to build a world in which silence in the face of injustice does not prevail, where evils of xenophobia and homophobia and racism and sexism finally and eternally are amputated from who and what we are, a world in which all people are showered with grace and dignity that is required to be shown of the children of God. Jesus did not absolve us of our purpose. Instead, he called us to be partners with him in the pursuit of justice everywhere. Paul reminds us in his letter today that optimism, based on the assumption of positive outcomes, is fleeting. But optimism, based on a sense of purpose, is hope. And Keith Theodore of Hope, this new year offers us nothing but the opportunity to reestablish our sense of hope and to ground ourselves in a new sense of purpose. Purpose for our own lives and purpose for our world. They say that hindsight is 2020, and as the musicians make their way back for more worship, I ask you this. When we get to this point next year, do you want to find yourself focusing on the past, on all of the would-haves and could-haves and should-haves of the year? Or do you want to make your commitment now, your commitment to listen to the call of Christ in your life, to be all in, to press on, even when it seems like the world is pressing right back at you? So that when you get to this point next year, you don't even have to look back because you know you've already found yourself, a brand new you, ready to face a brand new world. My friends, it's time to get real. It's time to get a new perspective. It's time to find our purpose as people, as Christians, as a church.
that we might continue to press on, striving for that which God in Christ Jesus has called us, that God in Christ Jesus has equipped us, and God's promise that in Christ Jesus we will never be led astray. To all this, the glory of God. Amen. Amen.